When most of us think of the personification of death, what we know as the Grim Reaper, our minds go to the cloaked skeleton, scythe in hand, gently treading the ground behind the latest visitor to the realm of the dead. Though most famed personification of death today, the Grim Reaper, is the most contemporary, and I use that term lightly, iteration of death, but for thousands of years and across all cultures, death had a form in some manner. There are those who, like Grimm, are gentle psychopomp figures who escort the newly dead to the underworld, from the Egyptian Anubis to the Hindu deity Yama, Charon or Charon of Greek ferryman, Hecate and Hermes, and also the Norse Valkyries and the Etruscan Val. The majority of these figures are male, and the Grim Reaper is very much coded and regarded as in the consciousness as a male figure. However, in the Romance languages, including Portuguese, Italian, French and Romanian, the noun death is feminine, and as such, the personification of death is very often a woman. And it is here, dear listeners, that I introduce you to our first Lady of Death, Mictacarsi Wattle. We don't know a lot about Mictacarsi Wattle, but what we do know about her is that she was the queen of the underworld in Aztec mythology. This Lady of the Dead had one particular role in the underworld, and that was to watch over the bones of the dead. Much like the Grim Reaper that we know today, Mictacarsi Wattle was depicted as a fleshless body with an agape jaw through which she was known to swallow the stars during the day. We know human skulls and bones are universal symbols of death, but these images are used in an incredibly unique way across ancient Mesoamerica. Now, whilst I might use some broad, sweeping statements, which may imply that ancient Mesoamerica iconography is a cohesive whole, it's important to stress that it's not. My language in this episode is tailored for the easy consumption for you, dear listener, and is not intended in any way to lump all ancient civilizations together in an oversimplified manner, which is intentionally dismissive of diversity of the pre-Columbian world. The pre-Columbian world was artistically and symbolically nuanced, with elements of the culture operating according to different social principles. Whilst the image of death is significant, it would be disingenuous to say that the image of death was pervasive across the pre-Hispanic Centro Mexico, as that wasn't the case. The ancient Maya, for example, flourished in the southern eastern Mesoamerica, but were not as obsessed with death as the Aztecs were. So, very little is known about Mictacasi Wattle. What we know about her is that she presided over the Aztec Festival of the Dead, which has evolved into the El Dia de los Muertos, which is celebrated to this very day, 3,000 years later, in the first few days of November. The Aztecs and the Nahua peoples believed that upon dying, a person would travel to Chikwuna Mictlan, the land of the dead, and it was only after journeying through nine levels over several years that a soul's person would finally reach Mictlan, the resting place for the soul. And yes, if you watched my video on the Greek afterlife as well, there's very similar overlaps. It is believed that on El Dia de los Muertos, the border between the spirit world and the real world dissolve, and the souls return to the earth to coexist with family members. In Narwhal rituals honouring the dead, traditionally held in August, family members provided food, water and tools to aid the deceased in a difficult journey. This inspired the contemporary Day of the Dead practice, in which people leave food and other offerings to their loved ones' graves, or set them out on makeshift altars called ofrendas in their homes. Since the Aztecs were the leading power holders at the time of the Spanish conquest, it is reasonable to suppose that it was their iconography, rather than that of their predecessors, that was carried over into the art of colonial Mexico and exerted a long-term influence over folk art 
associated with the Day of the Dead. There are three core elements of Aztec art that scholars focus on when discussing the indigenous interest in death. The well-preserved Sompantli, which was found at the site of the great temple at the Aztec capital Tenochtitlan. On each side of this structure, there are five horizontal rows of 16 stone skulls, which form a tightly knit design that completely covers the base of the platform. Then there are numerous prominent stone sculptures of deities who are represented with skull-like features, and one of the most famous of this image is Coatlicue, the goddess of the earth, life and death, whose face usually appears as a skull. The over 10 foot tall Coatlicue sculpture in Mexico City National Museum of Anthropology is one of the most famous Aztec sculptures in existence. Stone snakes slither across the surface of her statue, forming a belt and a skirt for the goddess, and hold her skull belt buckle in place. Two huge snakes curl up from her neck to her face, and her exposed torso and breasts roll into her abdomen. And she adorns a necklace that consists of hands and hearts, which largely obscure her breasts. Her face is formed by two facing serpents, and their bifurcated tongues represent blood spurting from her neck after she has been decapitated. Her arms are also formed of snake heads, suggesting that she was dismembered there as well. Coatlicue was not a psychopomp, but the presence of skulls in her imagery showcased that skulls were more than just a symbol of death across ancient Mesoamerica. They were also symbols of fertility, health and abundance, alluding to the close symbolic links between life and death. Though unrelated to technically the Lady of Dead's discussion, you're probably a bit curious about the story behind Coatlicue's decapitation, so let's explore that briefly. According to the myth, one day Coatlicue was sleeping atop Coatepec, or the Snake Mountain, when a feather fell upon her apron. At that moment, she conceived a son, Huitzinopotli, the sun god or warrior god. Upon hearing that her mother was pregnant, Koal Shorki became enraged. She rallied her 400 brothers, known as the Sensonitsi Nawa, and to storm Snake Mountain to kill her mother. One of her brothers decided to warn Koatlikwe, his mother, who was terrified of her impending death. But the son within her womb, Huitzilopochtli, comforted her and told her not to worry. The second Koyal Shalki approached her mother, Huitzilopochtli was immediately born, fully grown and armed. He sliced off his sister's head and he threw her body off the mountain. As she fell, her body broke apart until it came to rest at the bottom of Snake Mountain. Now, I know what you're thinking. Um, that story didn't involve Coatli Kwe being decapitated at all. Instead, it was her daughter who was decapitated. The reason I told this story is that it's often mistold as the way Coatli Kwe was decapitated. Some people see the statue and associate this mythology with the decapitation of Coatli Kwe, but her decapitation actually more likely comes from another myth concerning the beginning of the fifth era or the fifth sun. You see, the Aztecs believed that there were four earlier suns or eras prior to the one in which we currently live. The myth which marks our entrance into the then current fifth sun tells us how several female deities in which Coatlicue was likely among them sacrificed themselves to put the sun in motion, effectively allowing time to continue. These women's sacrifices are the sole reason that the cosmos was preserved today, according to the myth, which is quite sweet. If you're interested in any other topics that may be a shorter video, I have a link to a form where you can fill out requests in the description box down below. Thank you so much again for supporting this channel. Thank you so much to my patrons, particularly my top tier patrons, highlight here. And I will see you soon for another video. And remember, books save lives, so keep reading.